and welcome to Festival Speaks. Today is the last Friday of May, and this is a bonus episode. Ba -ba. So bonus episodes happen every once in a while. They are with greatest thanks to patrons of the podcast, whether that be Patreon, Ko-Fi, or PayPal. Uh, but if you enjoy this podcast, you can either become a patron of the podcast in one of those three things, or send huge psychic thank yous out to those folks, uh, because they are what makes it possible for me to continue doing a podcast. Um, if you don't know a podcaster personally, or, you know, I've just never taken the time to think about it. It does take a huge amount of time, preparation, and most importantly, mental headspace that they could be committing to other revenue streams or projects or, you know, meditation. So it's important for me when I'm consuming media that's been basically created for me as a non you know, I'm, it's it's the very best things about what public access TV used to be, right? And so I try to support things that I'm interested in because that's the content that I want to view. Uh, my husband and I recently went on just a weekend overnight thing and we watched cable for the first time. And it is torturous for me to watch commercials. It's just like my own, well, I mean, it was for him too, but actually him more so than me maybe. Um, but for me personally, it is actually like hard on my spirit in a way that I can't completely explain um, to watch commercials because it, it leaves me with great want in my heart that I'm not really good at, that I'm good at logically understanding that I don't need um, a $1,500 stove because it's gorgeous and I could use it a lot. Um, like I can understand that logically and that like I have chosen a lifestyle where I don't have like $1,500 just like laying around on the kitchen counter. Um, but it's hard for me to understand that spiritually. <laughs> so I try to support um, all sorts of entertainment and media that I can that is not reliant on those kinds of ad dollars. So that's one of the reasons that I am patrons of other podcasts um, and try to support them in as many ways as I can because that is just a media f form that I really prefer consuming. And that is all to say... Let's talk about dollars because I'm going to be talking about dollars in this episode and I am very Midwestern and very not good about talking about dollars. So um, I will set this episode up to say, if you're looking for a regular chatty episode, this isn't it. This one's going to be all about tools. Okay. So it's going to be all about knitting and crochet tools that I use. Um, and what I've used in the past maybe, and like what I think works for me best now. Um, but I also want to say with that, I will try to talk about like um, low cost options if I don't currently use them that maybe I've used in the past or that I know for other folks who use. And so I awkwardly want to talk about the difference that I... Um, the amount, like the percentage of my income that I spend on knitting now versus what it was, you know, I've been knitting for 26 years. And even like one of the first wool festivals I went to, probably I mean, my kiddo was little, so maybe 10 or maybe, maybe more like 12 years, 13 years ago, um, there was hand dyed sock yarn there. And I, and it was like a $30 skein price point, And that kind of blew my mind that that was even, I mean I know that I had seen yarns that were more expensive at like an LYS or what have you but like the fact that that the hand dyed yarn or maybe like small batch mill spun yarns which are just inherently more expensive because people are touching them more often they require creative inputs you know they're not made on a mass scale so they don't have those um those price breaks put into them and you know often they're a domestic product in a small manufacturer so that is all to say that I can remember looking at that price point and just being like what because at the time I know I only knit garments like at that time like because I was definitely a knitter who felt like you only needed one hat and you only needed a pair of gloves but you could probably use multiple sweaters um and so <laughs> That, I'm just trying to explain that like like my priorities and like the capital K of my knitterness has changed over those years. And I've gone from being a very, very practical 
my stash fits in like um, a small bin that can go under my bed person. You know, I'm taking like maybe three or four skeins that were just like leftovers uh, where I only purchased yarn for one project at a time and I was a monogamous knitter to, and again, I was like a person who only had one hat, to the person now whose job it is to do knitting. Like the podcast is a big part of, um, well, it's kind of a big part of who I am now, which is kind of strange, but it's also a big part of my personal finances. Um, and so I have the pleasure of being able to um, invest more of like a greater percentage of my household income into knitting, knitting tools and things like that than I would have if I were working a regular nine to five job. So that's all to say that like some of the things I have are pricier than somebody in my income bracket would normally have access to. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that. But I'll try to talk about, you know, different price points from things that I have used and will and are and I am using. Awkward. <laughs> so I will also try to timestamp I will try I will timestamp this video so that you can just go to sections that you're interested in, like if you're trying to buy some, looking for some knitting needles at this at this time and you just want to hear about knitting needles or you're looking for a Swift or what have you. So let's talk about needles because I feel like they're the most kind of basic option, right? So um, what I can say, there's, so there's, there's like infinite variety, right? These are the things that I have purchased in my life. Um, certainly like when I first started knitting, is very different than what there is available now. Um, what I use now are Chowgu interchangeable red lace twist or whatever. Okay, those are the ones that I use. I really like them. Um, I have no regrets. I have this a set that has um, this, you know, the full set. I rarely use the larger needles. But I liked having them because, again, like, it's just nice to know that I have them. I know where they're at um, and that kind of thing. And I have multiple tips that I have used. I've, I've had maybe one cord break over the several, several years I've had my set. Um, would I say that you should purchase them before you've even knit with the Chowgu Red Lace? No. Because some people do not like the cords. Um, it, you know, it's definitely a matter of personal preference. But I like the tips. They're a very sharp tip, but not so sharp that I injure myself. I like the consistency of the cord. Um, it's firm enough that I'm a pusher. Like, I tend to push my yarn. Um, whereas some people pull. and It's just... It makes a difference in the consistency of your cable. Like, I don't really like Haya Haya's because the cable is too flip, flippy floppy um, for me. But, obviously everybody's their own person. If you like wooden needles, I also really like, I didn't bring any of the fixed circulars, but the um, Knitter's Pride Dreams these are double points, but I really do like their fixed circulars and I have several pairs of them. Sometimes I'm just in a mood to knit with them or like the yarn just feels like it's a little too slippy on metal or whatever. Um, but those are the needles that I use almost exclusively now um, in terms of like my circular needles. Okay, so there's the circular needles that I use almost exclusively. If I were talking to a new knitter or you know, maybe somebody who's just has knit one or two things, whatever. Um, your most budget friendly option in terms of if you want to buy something from your LYS, um, you want consistency across the set, whatever. If you like the Chowgu Red Lace, it's just to buy exclusively 42 inch needles and just have one of each size that you use regularly. And um, just magic loop everything. You can magic loop your sleeves, your hats, your necklines. You don't need, you know, a 16 inch, a 27 inch, a 42 inch, you know, you don't need that. You, as long as you are comfortable with magic looping, you can use one needle for whatever project you're using, unless maybe it's a huge blanket or something and 
I mean, I can't imagine. I wouldn't be able to fit something on a 42-inch needle, but it's possible, I guess. <laughs> but that is your most, like, budget-friendly LYS option. Um, and then, you know, obviously you could add pairs as you wanted, but you don't ever really need to if you're a monogamous knitter. You can just live with those 42-inch needles for the day. Now, if you're on like a super, super tight budget and you're not really sure that this knitting thing is going to be your jam, you can find needle sets on Amazon, like a whole set for like 10 bucks. I mean, they're not the greatest needles. Um, they have usually blunt tips there, which I don't love, but some knitters do prefer a, a rounded tip. Um, I actually, the ones that I have purchased in the past on Amazon, like when I first kind of discovered them, like as a backup set of needles, had, um, and I did like the consistency of the cable. Um, as with anything, this is not a class on economics or economic impacts. I will say that you cannot guarantee that people who manufacture those, you know, 15 needles for 15 bucks, that the folks who manufacture those are in any worse shape than the folks who manufacture, let's just say Chow Goose, um, or Knitter's Dream, whatever. I don't actually know where any of these needles come from. And that is laziness on my part, lack of, clear, like lack of um, transparency on like just our general system. Um, of consumerism, but it would be naive of me to assume that the folks who make the Chow Goo needles or the Knitter's Pride needles are in a better working environment or have better um, access to healthcare or whatever than the folks who make those other needles because, you know, that I'm assuming from what I'm looking like, I'm buying them from the manufacturer. I said Amazon, eBay, as I believe where I bought them. Um, you know, that's, the, so that, all that price is going to the manufacturer versus, you know, a Chowgu or a Knitter's Pride where, you know, I'm assuming something like 40 to 50% of it is going to the retailer. You have a salesperson who's taking some sort of cut. You have ad expenses. You have distribution expenses. You have warehousing expenses. You have, you know, all of these other expenses are included in that retail price. Um, and so I don't know what percentage of that trickles down to the actual manufacturer. That said, obviously you are supporting your LYS um, and that business if you can, if you purchase those other needles, if nothing else. So that's all I'll say about that. Um, but I have used those eBay needles and I, they're fine. They're not my favorite by any stretch, but they are. Sometimes it's nice to just have a backup set of needles um, just in case something goes wrong. If you are one of those people who only has, you know, one 42 inch needle for everything, like it's good to just have a backup just in case a cable breaks or, you know, something goes awry. Um, I've had Chow Gu needles forever. I mean, probably for eight, nine, ten years. And I've, and I knit a lot and I've had very few break. Um, in terms of like the cable join, very few. Um, I've knit with lots of other needles, like signatures. I've never purchased signatures, but I've knit with them like in a tasting room and things like that. Um, but these are still actually the ones I prefer. So yeah. Double points. Um, if you are a double point knitter, I really like the Knitter's Pride Dreams. If you're looking for wood, I usually just get the sock sets because, which usually carry zero up to three US threes because that's what I knit the most often. Um, but I also really like carbons for sock knitting specifically. So I usually knit my socks if I'm knitting on double points, I knit, usually knit my socks on a zero. Um, and I, I've just never had good luck with wooden needles not breaking on me. And I really like the carbons. They don't bend. Um, they don't have the best tip. It's a little bit more rounded than I would love it to be, but whatever. It works out just fine for me, and I like them, and they're a pretty economical price point. Um, and so again, I think these are all five inches, right? Yeah, well, these are six inches, excuse me. 
So I guess, no, I can't. Yeah, they're six inches. <laughs> because again, usually I don't knit um, larger things on double points. I usually magic loop. Um, if I'm going to knit like a hat crown or something like that. So that's all I need. I do also have a set of, um, these are knit picks. What are these ones called? I don't know. They were like one of the, those, those, um, rainbowy looking ones. These are considered glove needles. They're four inches and they come in handy sometimes, not just for gloves, but like for cabling, you can use them as a cable needle. Um, and sometimes like on toys or something where it's just like tiny and fiddly, they do come in handy, but certainly not something you have to have by any stretch of the imagination. I have used Knit Picks um, circulars in the past, but I just would just go through them too quickly, especially that I think mostly I used interchangeables and I broke them quite a bit, but that's been probably seven or eight years that, since I've really used them on a regular basis. So those are what I use now. Um, they're the ones that work best for me. Um, Chowgu, one thing that I don't like, the red lace um, interchangeables. I do have the minis, which is like triple zero to US one and a half because the, the main sets start at a US two. And I don't really like those. Um, they are, the cable on them is really thin um, and, and actually it's thinner than it would be on their fixed circular. So like a double zero thick circular has a cord similar to a US two, but in the minis or the, the little tiny ones, the skinny, skinny minis, they, the cord is very thin and I don't like it as much, but that's just a personal preference. Uh, they are also ones that I've had, I broke one of them much more quickly than I've broken any of my other red ones. So but again, it was a sock one and it's probably got quite a bit of, and again, that's that thinner cable. So it's just not quite as durable. Um, I wouldn't tell anybody not to buy them. I'm not like, oh, but I just say that I don't like them myself. I would not repurchase them. So crochet tools, um, well, crochet hooks anyway. I have the set that looks like this that is um, available from Knit Picks. Um, I think Amazon sells them that are probably very similar as well. They are completely serviceable. I use them the most often because I have every size of them. I like them. This stuff is firm, but not hard. It has a good, for me, it's a good holding grip and what have you. I have used the wooden crochet hooks. For example, this is one from Knit Picks. I don't like them. Um, they're very attractive, but I just don't like knitting or crocheting with them. I think it's just a little bit too small for my hand. Um, but I also think I didn't love the, this looks good though. This hook looks good. Another crochet hook that's a little bit more expensive, but I really like quite a lot are these, are they it's P-R-Y-M, yeah, Prim, I guess. Um, and these my local yarn store has. I really like these, they feel great in my hand. The hook is pointy enough that I find it to be very useful. Um, and they just kind of feel good. Um, that's all I can say. <laughs> it's a crochet hook. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I've ever used. I've never used anything terribly fancy. Uh, I know that some people love the Brittany um, crochet hooks, but I've never used them. So I can't say one way or the other. But those are, those are my crochet hooks that I use. Okay, so larger things. For example, yarn swifts and what have you. I did not have a yarn swift for the first 10, 12 years that I knit. I just put my yarn on the back of a chair or, you know, across my knees um, and just wound yarn uh, into balls that way. So you don't need a Swift. They are nice to have. This is the first one that I purchased and I couldn't, I bet it was from Knit Picks, but I, I couldn't tell you. There's no uh, manufacturing information on it, but 
I still have it as a backup and I've replaced the the ties like a million times. These are original ones. These are like just like a hemp string or something. But you can see there's like 30 different flavors of yarn on them. Just over time they just break. But I mean, I've never had an actual wooden piece break. And so this has been a very durable piece of equipment for me. I've used it forever. Um, and again, I haven't used it for a while because I have a different Swift now. It actually has a giant cobweb on it, I just saw. I don't know if you can see. But um, very serviceable. I currently have a shocked um, fancy pants. What is it called? Ultimate Umbrella Swift or something like that. I really like it. It has a row counter on it, which was a big selling point for me as a spinner. A row counter is not the right word, but a revolution counter. Um, because as a spinner, it's really nice to be able to just start my yarn, you know, start the counter at zero, know how many revolutions it is, measure it so I know my approximate yardage versus trying to count in my head um, or count after the fact. So that was a really big selling point for me. They are pricey, um, but they're very durable. And um, the little like joining pieces are like a rubbery stuff and I've not had any issue with mine breaking down or needing to be replaced or anything like that. And as a general rule, Shocked is, makes a great product. So I'm not worried about its longevity um, or any issues with it. The other thing that was important to me was that it had, um, Shocked is, is primarily a spinning tool company. And so it has also like a turning knob on it. Again, not something you need to have for a Swift, but as a spinner, it's a nice thing to be able to just wind it that way um, when you're winding yarn onto it versus having to just like use, for one thing, for using a Nitty Knotty, which is very aesthetically pleasing, but I will be honest with you, my brain gets, like if I have a moment where I stop and think about how I'm winding onto the Nitty Knotty, my brain like melts. It's like thinking about your breathing and then not being able to breathe without thinking about it. It's that kind of thing. So <laughs> for me, I really prefer this over a Nitty Knotty. Um, I do still have an, like a small Nitty Knotty for classes and things like that for winding off samples or if I've just got like, if I've just done a sample on my own and I just need 25 yards or something or something, I'll use just a small Nitty Knotty. But that's one of those things that like you can pick them up at any, I think mine is just from a festival. I have no idea who the manufacturer is uh, or who the maker is because it's pretty basic. It's a dowel with two things on either side. Um, so you can get as basic or as fancy as you would like, right? And then kind of in the same vein as Nitty Knotties are ball winders. I had a Knit Picks ball winder for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, I think before that I had a completely, I think I had a second hand one that I just got from like a, like a left, like a free table at um, my college. Um, oh my gosh, I just had another dream about that last night. I had a dream that I had to move out of my dorm over the summer and I didn't know where I was going to put all my stuff. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I think I just had a ball winder that I found or was given like at a free thing, whatever. It's not something I purchased. Um, I had a Knit Picks one forever, was very pleased with it until I wasn't. I think it's just like after a while the gears just stripped down. And so currently I have, and so I would recommend one of them to anybody. Um, I did have like a crazy metal one for quite some time that I really loved until I didn't. <laughs> I really liked to have metal gears. It felt very sturdy, but it was like wicked loud to spin or to wind yarn with. And it was probably a situation where something had gotten kind of out of whack and I just didn't know how to put it back into whack because this is the weird thing about ball winders. They're kind of a precision tool. Like it's amazing how easy it is to get them discombobulated. And you will have no idea until you try to wind yarn on them and then it makes the grossest yarn ball you've ever seen in your life. It's the worst. Um, but what I have now is a Nancy's Knit Knacks ball winder. It's not electric, it's still manual, uh, but it is a pricey ball winder. It's fancy. 
I would, if, I mean, it's definitely not necessary, <laughs> but I still like it. I don't regret the purchase at all. Um, because it will wind giant balls. Like if you're doing um, an eight or even a 12, like if I have a 12 ounce skein of something, it'll, it does every, I mean, it'll, it'll wind a yarn cake like this big. It's ridiculous. Um, but that said, like at one point I was having this trouble with it. I was just making every yarn ball I was making was like, it had like a, either a loop out of whack or like it just looked like total garbage. And that's because there's like this rubber gasket around the base of like the cone and it meets like the point that creates the center, the sin, the, 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 the spinning of that part. And I didn't know that it needed to be replaced every once in a while. So it, over time it just gotten dried out and it was causing yarn barf. Like it was causing my knitting balls to be disgusting, but I had no idea. I was just like really ticked for quite some time that my yarn winder wasn't working and I was really miffed about it. Well, it was like this dollar fifty part that I needed to replace. <laughs> so it's a lesson to myself that before I get real worked up about the thing I have not working, is I should check to see if there was any um, maintenance I needed to do, and there was. User error. So I don't regret any of those things that I own, but you could certainly have budget friendly. Item. Again, you don't even need these things. You don't need a Swift or a yarn winder. They just are convenient and nice. Um, and the other thing that's surreal about them is that they require being set up. Like, I have one set up permanently now because, again, a big part of my life is committed to yarn. But for the longest time, it wasn't. And so sometimes if I just needed to wind one skein of yarn, it was still easier just to put it on a chair and wind it by hand than it was to, like, get the Swift out, find something to put it on, you know. And I did that even you know after I had a knitting podcast so yeah it's your call so that's swifts and bowl winders so I guess we'll call this part measuring devices you need a measuring tape you know you need that there's no make sure your measuring tape is actually correct I just certainly know people um, who have measuring tapes that they realized later were completely incorrect Um, and even after, even I have a quality measuring tape, but after time, like they just get stretched out and what have you, but you need measuring tape. You need a, f you need this thing. This one is from Simply Sock Yarns. I think I got it free in an order. You need one of those. Um, things you don't need, but I like. I have this, if you're, if you do like to knit socks, this is kind of a cheesy, but useful tool. Um, this is the sock ruler. You can buy them at SockRuler.com if your local yarn store doesn't have them. Um, and it's really just, just like half of a second easier than using a measuring tape. It's slightly more consistent. You just put your sock in there to measure from your toe and see how, it's totally not necessary, but I still like it and I'm glad I have one. Um, I also have this one, which is a sock. X-O-X-Y-Z-Z -Z, and it even has my little name on it. So this one is very similar to the little plastic ruler except it also has US shoe sizes listed on it and I'm pretty sure you can get one metric with um, different shoe sizes but it has like baby foot, it has little ones, big kids, hers and his. Um, so shoe sizes so you know if you regularly knit socks for other folks and you don't want to have to keep looking for what length their foot is. Like, you probably know yours. Um, it's kind of a handy thing. And also, it's just fun. <laughs> don't need it. So I also have this Ann Bud Ruler. I don't know if it's called something. I don't know. Um... And it's this clear ruler, and it has both black line and white line. <laughs> it has both a black line and a white line. So you can just lay it on top of your knitting and get an idea of your gauge by how it matches up. Isn't that clever? So, obviously this is not going to be your most accurate gauge. 
in terms of like it's measuring a very small amount where you're normally measuring gauge over a larger distance but it's great for just getting an idea like when you're knitting a swatch and you're like am i even in the ballpark and you lay it down even or as you're knitting a sweater or what have you you know lots of times your project your gauge will kind of change as you're knitting um and so it's a good idea to just kind of like oh okay i'm still on track or oh, I have relaxed, or oh, that stressful movie made my knitting gauge too tight. So it's just a nice thing, not necessary, but just nice um, to have handy. So that's measuring things. Yeah. So another thing that I have that you do not need are sock blockers. So they look like this. Um, this pair is made by Sunrise Grove Knittery. You can find them at sunrisegrove.com. Um, I do recommend, even though aesthetically I like wooden ones, I do in this case recommend um, acrylic. Just, they're lower maintenance. Um, I have a set of wooden ones that I needed for, well, that I wanted for my larger socks. Um, and I couldn't find acrylic ones. But they need to be sanded pretty frequently. Um, because it's super easy. This is so smooth. My sock blockers aren't. Maybe it's just the ones I have. <laughs> it's very easy when you're putting the socks on for them to kind of grab and catch. And it's never hurt any socks, but I just don't like it. Um, and so I do recommend the acrylic ones. The, you know, you want ones with holes in them or that have, that encourage airflow. Uh, but really, I just have these mostly so that I can take pictures or show things on the podcast. So if you're not super into taking photographs of your knits, you don't need these for, I've never put a pair of socks on these that I have washed for myself, like after the initial showing them on the podcast. So you don't, you don't need these, but they're fun. <laughs> Sometimes they're just a good festival purchase. And so in other blocking tools, um, I have things I actually don't use very often, but that I do have, I have um, the like blocking mats that are just like little squares that kind of like interlock like um sometimes you see them for like play floors or whatever mine were from nitpicks but I've never heard anybody say that they didn't like theirs um you don't need them you can just use a towel you can use if you have a spare bread bed you can use that but we don't in our house um so I have purchased the knitting blockers you know the mat thing and I do appreciate them I don't regret that purchase they are not that pricey um, and they are handy if you don't have a bed or whatever that you can dry something on overnight or for multiple hours I definitely need blocking pins like t-pins are the best um, but in terms of blocking wires again I don't use them that often but I'm kind of glad that I do have them when I want them um, is this ancient set from Knit Picks. I wish, I wonder if the date's still on them. Oh, I don't see it. But they're probably 10 years old, at least. And they're just wires. They do bend, um, and they kind of stay bent if you're not, well, if you're a human. Uh, but that doesn't matter because you're pinning them out anyway. So, um, I have these. I like them. I also have flexible blocking wires and they are, these are by Inspinity of Sutton, Massachusetts, I-N-S-P-I-N-K-N-I-T-T-Y. -I -I um, and they are exactly what they sound like. They are wires that, for example, if you're doing um, a curved shawl, um, you can lace this through the edge and then block it to shape um, however you want to. So they're flexible. You can, you know, mold them in the way that you need to. Um, again, I probably haven't used them for five years because the way I block shawls now, almost every shawl I make, I block. I wash it. Oh, that's a good spinning tool. Um, it's a salad spinner. If you can find one at Goodwill or like you have an old one or whatever, um, 
A salad spinner is a great tool once you wash your knits, as long as it's not like a huge one, but most shawls will fit in there. Um, you wash it, you know, squeeze the water out of it, put it in the salad spinner, and it'll force out the extra water. They're very handy. I highly recommend a, a salad spinner. Um, but the way I block things almost exclusively now is to wash them, put them in the salad spinner, and then I have um, like a gold, well now I have a line outside, but if you don't have a line outside, even like a gold wing drying rack, like a metal that you dry your clothes on, and then I just pin it like with clothes pins, and if it is something that has a shape, like a point or something, and I, and I look at it and it doesn't look like the shape is kind of going out, it's not like highlighted in the way I like, I'll just add clothes pins to the edge of it to give it some more weight, um, and that's almost all. So I don't regret having these because sometimes they come in handy, but you certainly don't need to rush to get them unless you knit almost like exclusively lace shawls. And then I'd say, hey, that's definitely worth your investment. Um, blocking wires are really nice if you're um, blocking sweaters, especially. Um, like if you've got a pieced sweater that you need to block before you sew it together. By the way, that's not a suggestion. Do that. If you have a sweater that you're knitting in pieces, you really do want to block it before you sew it together. Trust me. I know it's a pain, but just, just do it. You're going to be happier with the results. It will be easier to sew and everything. Um, but yeah, I don't regret either of those purchases, but I do not use them very often. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else that's a blocking tool. Yeah, my drying rack, clothesline, whatever. Your ironing board. You can also use your ironing board. Um, if you have T-pins, you can just pin a shawl around the edge of your ironing board, um, as long as it's sturdy enough, obviously. Uh, but most of them are. I'm trying to think of anything else I've used to block stuff. I've never purchased like um, like a head blocking thing for a hat because I usually just wash them and lay them flat to dry. Yeah, those are blocking tools. Okay, so then the rest will just be like bits and bobs. One thing that I find very useful to have is a little gram scale. You want something that'll measure at least into the tenths of an ounce, but, or the tenths of a gram, excuse me. Um, you wanna have something that at least go to 0 0.1 gram. Uh, this one is one hundredths, but they are super handy. Um, I recommend anybody to have these, really. Even if you're like not a capital K knitter, they are very useful. Um, there are some shawls like um, Susan B. Anderson's Weigh It, where they'll actually tell you how to, you know, tell you how much of a yarn you need for certain things, but it's just handy to have. Like, once you start accumulating stash, it's just super helpful to know how much yarn you have of something. Um, where again, if you're knitting and you're just playing yarn chicken, you can measure how much yarn a row took and then you'll know. So I really recommend them. They're not expensive at all. You know, I think like 15 bucks or something like that. Um, and they are just super duper handy. And then the rest of the things will just be like stuff that are in my bits and bobs boxes. Um, these little boxes are super nice. These are medicine boxes, um, but they have a magnetic closure and then they just have these little doors right? And so you can put stitch markers or whatever in here, bobby pins if you are rocking the Victorian bun. Um, another thing that's in mine are these little grab it things. These are needle grabbers. They're specifically made by Dritz. Um, so for like sewing, like if you need to grab a sewing needle and pull it through something that's, that's heavy, it's very useful for that. It's also useful for tightening your um, interchangeable needles. So if you maybe are like me and can't ever hold on to anything, um, you can tighten your interchangeable needles with any sort of needle, sewing needle, T-pin. This might actually be too big, but we'll see. Um, for example, for mine, the um, hole is in the cord itself. So you can just put the, t the needle through the little hole of the cord. 
screw thing on. And then you can use this to tighten like you're going against each other. Um, my chow goos will unscrew if I don't tighten them like that. I didn't mention that during the knitting part. I should have knitting you apart. Um, they will, mine will untwist unless I actually tighten them this way. Um, it just depends a lot on how, and see now I can't actually undo it unless I put the needle back in. <laughs> a lot of it just depends on how you move your hands when you're knitting. Um, some people never have trouble with their needles coming unscrewed. I do unless I tighten them. So this little thing is super handy. If you're, you know, if you have one of those jar openers or like you have those things at your grocery store, you can cut up pieces of that or like that weird shelf liner that's kind of like fluffy. Um, lots of different options, but those are very handy. I've never really used consistently like needle tips or anything like that. Um, I do use stitch markers. I really like closed stitch markers. They're my favorite. Just loops. I don't like them as aesthetically as much, but for practicality, they're wonderful. If you're knitting flat, especially, like if you have a cute stitch marker that has like a hangy bit, you know, like one of these kind of things, every time you go to that marker, you have to flip it over, or at least I do, which is annoying to me. I know, I'm a process knitter, but I'm also about efficiency. So I really like these. When you're knitting in the round, it doesn't matter as much, so I'll use my froofy markers then. Um, but again, if you're a budget knitter, you can get these lightning bulb um, safety pin kind of markers, and then you can use them for regular stitch markers or removable stitch markers or you know, to hold on to a few stitches or whatever. And you get like a million of them for like three cents. That's not exactly true, but it's close. Um, they are definitely a budget option. I think most of the ones that I like, I've, <laughs> I've gotten um, just like accumulated over the years. Like um, when you order from Susan B. Anderson, lots of times there'll be some in your package. <laughs> But I do know that you can get them. Um, I think I saw them through Knit Picks, but now I can't remember. Anyway, lots of LYSs will have them. I also have some really cute metal ones that I purchased on Etsy, you know, that are just like stars or hexagons or whatever. But I just really like a closed stitch marker um, for knitting flat. Knitting in the round, I'll use fancy things. But that's definitely a situation where the sky's the limit. I definitely have some, um, you know, $15 a piece stitch markers because they're carved and they were really cute and I don't regret any of them. Yeah, no, no regrets. You need a tapestry, you need some needles. It's good to have both, um, with a big eye, it's good to have both like your regular yard needles, like the, um, this place is such a crazy mess, by the way. <laughs> it's belt. What? Where are they? Okay, there. Ooh. What are these? The clo these are clovers. Um, you want yarn needles, but you don't need anything fancy. I like these, but mostly because they come in this thing that makes them easy for me to find. But you do. Lots of times they are just blunt tip, and I do like to have a sharp one. Um, either for darning, like if I'm darning a sock, it's very helpful to have a sharp needle. You can go in, be like you can split threads. Um, there's just, you know, random double points that I just, <laughs> but it's, it's just helpful. Um, sometimes when weaving in ends, it, you need to kind of get between, uh, you know, to, to sew into a thread, um, depending on what you're making. But I recommend that as well. When I first started finding handmade stitch markers, I used these, which are row counters. And these are quite nice too. Um, you can totally just, oh, by the way, stitch markers, you don't even need those super cheap lightning bulb ones. You can just tie a circle of yarn. That's what I used for the first 15 years I was knitting, maybe 20. Okay, not 20, 17, I don't know. It's, I was very, very practical about my knitting costs. <laughs> now it's just out of control. 
Um, but like these were very cool to me that you could, um, you know, as you knit your rows, because I was never good at remembering to write it down or using one of those little finger marker things. I think I have one that, no, I don't. Um, that was in like a prize thing or something, but, um, so I've never really had good luck with using them. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just the way my specific brain works, but this you come to it and then you move it. Like there's no like remembering to do something else. Um, so I found these to be useful, but again, you don't need one of these even. This is most helpful when you don't know how to read your knitting. Or for me, even still, if I'm doing cabling in the round, when I'm knitting flat, it's usually pretty easy for me to tell where I'm at. But if I'm doing cabling in the round, lots of times it's very hard for me to remember like, am I on the third row or the fourth row before, after that cable? Um, but you don't even need this. You can just use a piece of yarn, you know, lay it down between two stitches. And then when you knit over that, like count those ladders and that's how many rows you've made. You don't, you know, everything can be minimized. You don't need most of this stuff. Um, but I think that's primarily, I think everything else is just like variations on those things that are in my, but I mean, you might need a lamp work mushroom. I mean, you might need, like actually, it's your call, but you might need it. I needed it. Same. And then I think that's all for knitting tools. Um, certainly, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the drop down or make suggestions of your own, things that you have found useful that you really like, um, or things that you've that have not worked out for you. That's also fine. Um, yeah. I hope you found it useful. I hope that if you stayed this long, you found it useful. <laughs> I'll talk to you next time. Bye.